That was a beautiful sound. Let's give her another round of applause, please. That was a beautiful sound. Thank you, man. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here again. I always tell Miss Middleton every time I come out this way, I always get a feeling as my ancestors are still here, the spirits. I feel motivated. I feel like I want to inoculate. I feel like I want to just humble myself. Y'all have the power. Y'all have the history. Y'all have everything that it's going to take for us as a people to move forward. And when I say us, I'm talking about people of all creeds and all colors. We qualify that. I'm talking about all of God's creatures because we are all created and equal in his sight. Now this gentleman here, evidently he had a vision. Mr. Max Senior, I did not know him. I just learned about him today just from discussion around that table. And if this gentleman had a vision, and I'm standing on his house, his property, because he saw it not robbery to leave a place where you could meet. Us, we, can have a place to communicate and to educate and to inoculate our children for the future. If Mr. Max Sr. can do that, that tells me he was a visionary. We need more visionaries. We talk about February being a Black History Month. Now, if you believe that, you know the history behind it, I can go back to this gentleman here. Evidently, he knew about it. He had a vision centered around economic empowerment. I was just at the table here talking to these leaders, and we were talking about economic empowerment. We need that more so than ever. Because if you don't have that, ladies and gentlemen, we're lost. Well, how you know, Representative, because I come from a lost city called Charleston, Chucktown, the holy city, city by the truth to see. I don't call Charleston the holy city no more. I call it the hotel city. Come on. That's a lost city. Did we have an opportunity? Yes. Because when I was a young lad, the churches, all the lots, the properties, God had put them right next to it. Economic empowerment. You see, while we were praising Jesus, we weren't doing the work downtown. No, we were doing bickering after one another. The devil was busy. Why are you telling us that? Because it's centered around economic empowerment. You want to know why I'm telling you that, ladies and gentlemen? A lot of you here online. Y'all want to talk about black history? Let's let's talk about black economics. I know a guy named Esau Jenkins. I know the history of Esau Jenkins. I know some of his family members. He empowered his people from an economic standpoint. Gentlemen owned restaurants, land, hotels. And he empowered his people. And what did we do with it? Well, you do the math. If I'm here from Charleston, tell you know, Esau Jenkins had a, a hotel right on Spring Street. Boy, I love my history. Esau Jenkins, the family still owned property on King Street. Got a history we can be proud of because they knew about having economics as the future, the pathway for our people. We're talking black history now. Then you had another leader. 
Ms. Septima P. Clark. Then you had another leader, Dr. Martin Luther King. Y'all had a place that Dr. King visited twice, the Progressive Club. How many of you remember the Progressive Club? History tells us that Dr. King came out twice. That, that's noted in history. Now for you who never stood by or studied the man, Dr. King was a wee of a man. Five seven. Why are you telling us that? Because size doesn't matter. It's your heart and what's up here. The thing that God he keeps us accountable for. Small statue of a man, but he had a voice. You would think he was ten feet tall. And he was a visionary. And he paid the price. He had connections to the islands. If we know these things, then we are, ought to feel empowered. Why are we losing? I don't know why we had more businesses back in the 60s. I don't know why we were more, I'm not going to say together, but we were more as one. Oneness we had. And there's something said in call education. See, education, you know, it's always good to have. But always humble yourself as you learn. In other words, people, you send your kids to college. They go out and they become entrepreneurs, professors, doctors. But you know what they're not doing? Smurf, Pastor Dixon, they're not looking back. Not looking back. We got more, I'm not going to use that term, African Americans. 20 years later, it's going to be something else, and I don't want, I'm going to stick with black. I love black. I'm black and proud. I tell my Jewish friends and white friends, if you ain't white and proud, I don't want to hang with you. Because I'm okay. If you're an Indian, a Native American, if you don't love who you are, I don't want to hang with you. I got to hang with people on the move. Dr. King was on the move. One of his best speeches, very short. I clocked it at 3.5 minutes. It was called Keep Moving. Keep Moving. Whatever you do in life, keep moving. When people throw pies in your face, knock you down, talk about you, hold your back, keep moving. Believe in yourself, but keep moving. Because life is short. You don't think life is short. Then I want to take you to a place called Parkland, Florida. 17 kids. You don't think life is short. We can go to Columbine. We can keep traveling. The greatest country in the world, you send your kids off to school, and they don't come back. You go figure. You know the tie-in, ladies and gentlemen. You know the tie-in. I'm going to be honest with everybody. I bought a speech before Parkland. This was written. It was written in my heart. Before I got the phone call that a shooting was going on at another high school in the greatest country in the world, the speech was written. Why I'm telling you this? Because sometimes you can prepare for one thing. And when that sun come up in the sky, ladies and gentlemen, you are perplexed. You are taken back. I come to you today with a heavy heart. Because you know what's going on in our society. I come to you today, and I start to call Ms. Milliton and told her, right? look, I can't do it. Because my heart is heavy. I got a call on the way up here that my brother 
They used to call us twins, because I'm from a family of 11, the youngest of the boys. He had a stroke. You see, not only this was heavy, parking in Florida, now I'm dealing with my family. But I had to come do this. And you know why I was going to do it anyway? Because when I got up this morning and got on my knees, God told me to do it. Don't worry about parking. You got other things to worry about. Now, a couple of hours later, I get a phone call from my own family. That's why I always tell people, this thing we, we, we do with each other, try to play important, try to act like something you're not. We get off on praises, egos. When that casket is closed, people, it's all over. You're to be judged, just like everybody in this room will be judged. I came today to tell you, there is hope. Even though Parker in Florida sits out there, the tragedy is there. It's not your children. When you go home tonight, hug your kids. Tell them you love them. I'm going to tell you this, while I'm talking about Parker. You notice how the media played the gentleman up? He's this, he's disturbed, he's mentally challenged. Tell me this, how can a mentally challenged person know to go in a school and ring a fire alarm to cause a distraction to bring crowded people out and have a high power rifle? He already, and, and I, mean, I meant to tell you this too because I love to do research. You know where he learned how to shoot? high power rifle, the NRA, through a grant. You know the NRA, the people that all so Washington are afraid of, spineless, could care less about your children. NRA, trillion dollar company. Don't look for Washington for leadership. They've been bought out. Rubio threw eight million dollars during his tenure NRA supplying it. You know who the biggest beneficiary from the NRA? Your president. 25 mil. Clock. Those who are on Facebook with me, and I'm speaking from facts people because I love to do research, fact check me. They got about 18 other senators, NRA. NRA sending grant money to your community to teach your children how to shoot high-powered rifles. And you wonder why everybody in Washington can't pass a common a sense gun law? They've been bought. You wonder why the people at the state house where I am get up and say, oh, I want to introduce a bill, open carry. You know what an open carry is? I can have a strap on, you're supposed to see it, and I'm walking around the room. We just walk. You know what open carry is? In some states, people go to a burger place in the park, have an AK-17 strap on their back, open carry. If you think for a moment, the so-called founding fathers had that in mind, you gotta, you gotta be crazy. This thing about the Second Amendment. What about the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not is what I tell them in Columbia. But ladies and gentlemen. I know sometimes, because I've had people tell me many times, to Gilliard, you sound like, no, I'm, I'm not no preacher. I had to see the light and God didn't roll me around late at night. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not qualified. But i got to be me. What you hear and what you see is me. I don't have to disguise my voice. I don't have to talk like I'm from Europe. I'm from the country. Because you got to remember, before buildings and structure and infrastructure, the whole world is a country. I'm proud to be from the country. That's what people are trying to get back to now. Y'all better watch out. All my friends, all those years, was traveling to Seabrook and Kiwa Island. 
You know what they were doing when they were going to that beach? They were looking to the left and looking to the right. Now they're coming back at you. Economic empowerment. That's when you go down to them, the end of the uh, winding roads in the back, all of a sudden you see six-story houses slap you in the face with man-made lakes. You think you're in Disney World. Economic empowerment. People, let me, I, I, I'm so serious about this because one thing I want to leave you with tonight, being that this is Black History Month, and I celebrate like you all do in the room, 365 days a year, all of my dreams and all that stuff. When I go to the bathroom with a newspaper, I'll just celebrate. Got me? Celebrate. You know why? Because if we don't understand economic empowerment like Dr. King talked about so many times and taught us how to do it, if you got land, right, you can do on that property, that acreage, what you got is what we call a pub. A pub. What's that? Plan unit development. And I've got people, I know companies will come out and show you how to make that land work for you. You don't have to work the land, make the land work for you. And you can pass it on to your children and your children's children. Because that's what a lot of our white brothers and sisters are doing. A lot of our Jewish brothers and sisters are doing. But they're taking the land from many of the people who look like me. And we don't have no place to live. I've got people calling me up from homeless shelters. Smurf, Dixon, homeless shelters. We need help. I lost my house. We get that 24-7. Because if you're not understanding the basis of economics, then we're losing out. Emmanuel Church sits in my district. Yes, Clemente was my friend. Some of us now are claiming Clemente and didn't even like him. Oh, I'm a realist now. I'm going to tell you things, you know, the truth. I stand on the truth. Some of y'all some of y'all know the story behind that. But see, when you look at the Mother Emanuel situation, and I always tell my people, what are we learning from this? You see, why hold hands and praise God, which we ought to do. But you know what I'm doing on the side? I'm thinking about, okay, how can this church now become a part of our economic future? The money that's going to come in, you can buy homes. You can do things now to really, see, it ain't all about hanging signs and singing hallelujah. God tells us we have to show ourselves approved. So how do you do that? Ain't no reason for all them homeless shelters to be full downtown and you got mother man you've been through that tragedy down there. Redirect the power. You turn a tragedy to power. You, you see what I'm saying? I don't want no mayors and government to hold in my hand no more. I can't move in their communities. But you're going to come to my church and sing no. Don't come to my church and play no piano, no organ, and you gentrifying my people left and right. Wow. And here comes John's Island, Water Law. They're looking to do the same. You're gonna be gentrified if you know if you don't empower yourself from an economic standpoint. You want to talk black history? Let's talk black history. Let's save the black man and the black woman and the black land and the black children while we talk black history. State Black Caucus meeting last week. A gentleman raised his hand. Oh, we got to get some money for the Black Museum. I want y'all to go back. Tell, tell him I said it. I don't get it. Look. Who worried about museums? All them black people in prison? Locking these little black men up? Killing our young black men left and right? Black? What, what you going to do? Put black? Tell me and then say, yeah, this used to be the black race one time. Word. Word. Everybody raising their hand. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Oh, here's 10 million. Oh, here's 20 million. But ain't black people ain't got no place to live. Wow. But you want to go to a museum? Word. Come on. Word. Something ain't right about that picture, people. You better watch the trick. Oh, my God. 
Not good. I see the expression on some of y'all. Ooh, wait till I get on the phone to Mayor Riley. Mayor Riley ain't God. Declan Bird ain't God. I love all of them as brothers and sisters. But you cannot be gentrifying my people while you talking about building a black museum. What about black public housing? What about black education? I mean, if you're going to stand for something, stand on the truth, you're going to die one day. Now, what I told them at the state black caucus is, look, I'm not against the black museum. What we need to do is get what we call lateral economic empowerment. In other words, you give me something to leverage. So if you're talking about $100 million museum, let's talk about the six historic black community on the east side, the west side, and then we talk about tax money to fuse into those communities. See, lateral empowerment. Because the museum ain't going to come along but once in a lifetime. And some of y'all are educated people with degrees and stuff, you know what I'm talking about, but you got to stop going to these uppity parties and trying to act like something you're not. They don't want you there. You put a Negro when you walk in the door, you be a Negro when you walk out. All these cup Kool Aid parties, homeless shelters, overcrowded, kids getting killed in school. We talking black museum and if you gonna tie Black History Month with anything, it better be what this gentleman here did, or uh, Mr. Esau Jenkins did. They knew about economic empowerment. The great continent we call Africa. The only way our military survives is because of the natural resources they go over there and rob. The silver, the diamonds, the gold. But we better wake up. Africa could have ruled the world unto itself. Before, now how many of you, raise your hands, how many of you know about the continental divide? Raise your hands. That's when the world's one big mass. How many of you know, raise your hand if you know, how many of you now know that archaeologists, historians, they now know that the Garden of Eden is located in Ethiopia. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Don't be afraid, you've been emancipated. Now, not through Abraham Lincoln, I'm talking about through Christ. That's what I mean. Let's get that straight now. Now, oh, Abe did that for industry. He did that for industry reasons. Economic. Now, Abe was smart. He did that for economic reasons. Our people was brought over to the so-called new farmland for economic reasons. Because of your skin tone could last endurable in the weather. Right or wrong? You see, our white brothers and sisters had their own slaves dying in the field. I'm telling you part of history. But they saw more benefit that we endured longer. You, you, you got to remember that. You see, when we were at the gates of Sierra Leone, they brought kings, queens, soldiers, strapped down like fish, brought them through the middle passage to the new found land. And you know what God saw fit to do? took us out of the cotton fields and put you in the White House. Just to show you. Just to show you if you do it through faith, if you do it through prayer, that he's going to intercede. The same thing our ancestors came through with Johns Island, Watermelon, all the Sea Islands. They knew. This was the patch. This was the right of way. I know why I feel what good when I come out here. I'm, I'm in the middle of the passage, the road. My ancestors. See, we got so much things to be proud of. Every time I even get on the road to Watermelon, my antennas just go up. I'm, I'm driving to power. I'm driving to history. I'm driving to my ancestors. I'm driving to where they stood up and clung their hands together and sacrificed 
and took a harsh, harsh punishment for wanting to be somebody. I know why I get excited. I can look on that boat. I can come in here sound like, oh, wasn't he good? No, I, I, can, I can script like Donald Trump does. See, he's reading from that teleprompter. That's what we, we call being script. That means it's not coming from the heart. It's not coming from here. It's coming from your eyes. That means you can care less. And then he catch holy heck with the dog on teleprompter. Yeah. Yeah. You see, remember this, and, I, and, I, and I'm about to close now. Remember this, people. And I learned this the hard way, too. And I love all my people, don't get me wrong. But I got to stand on the truth. Because the truth sets me free. It'll set you free. Okay? But, people, what this country is seeing that's unfolding before us. Governor Nikki Haley. What happened, people? And this is this is the truth through research. Nikki Haley, if you remember during the presidential runoff when Donald Trump was running. Remember, Nikki Haley and our brother Tim Scott, when they came to South Carolina, they endorsed a Rubio. Y'all better wake up. We can write, I can write a book about this. The truth don't set me free. They endorsed a Rubio. Matter of fact, Nikki Haley went out her way and literally damned Donald Trump. Didn't want nothing to do with him. Call him everything but the name of God. Okay? Now, let's go to Donald Trump right quick. Donald Trump did not want to be president. I showed the sun in the sky. Donald Trump is a businessman. See, right, right now, people, check, check this out. Let me, I'm going to give you a case in point. So you, quick, pro, pro. Look, if you own property in hotels, you own things in the stock market, okay? You can go sign up to run for president, and what is your interest in your business going to do to stop? As soon as they see your name as president. Donald Trump was in it just to make money. He had convinced himself he wasn't going to win. But it was going to be good for his business. Okay? So when he signed his name to run, check the stock market. I read the book. This hotel interest went up. Golf course sold out. Everybody want to play. The man is running for president. da 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 Got on TV and made a national fool of himself. So he knew he wasn't going to win. Somewhere in the Bible it tells you, better be careful what you ask for. If you think he's happy in that White House, uh-uh. You can forget that. Okay? Now, in, all, in all due respect to his wife, she didn't even want to go there. And that's why she took six, almost three months to get in there. Some, some wife be kicking the door down there and meet you before you get there. <laughs> she didn't see it's a message and all that. Okay? Now, when Donald Trump won, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some history here. When he won, and he called South Carolina, he didn't want coming to Haley. He wanted McMaster's. You know what, you know what he was told? McMaster back then, okay, under our Constitution, he said it pro tem, right? You know what he told him? You can take this one to the bank. Uh, Trump, I don't want to come to Washington. All my life I wanted to be God. Under our Constitution, if you move this woman, I'll roll right in there. And Donald Trump did his buddy a favor. Y'all got to remember this. I was just telling the young ladies at the table, young men, sometimes knowledge can be a burden. You know, like when Noah built the ark, he knew he got instructions from God. Everybody was calling him silly, a quack, a fool, but he kept on working. 
because he was on a mission. He knew. Now, can you imagine how he felt when